and uh, welcome. Uh, welcome to this first event. It's a uh, first one of, um, of a series of live events with uh, Emma Heiderman. You can see her. Welcome, Emma. Good afternoon. Um, I just wanted to um, share with you some technical details before the, the session. Uh, first of all, on elionline.com slash webinar, you will be able to find all further information about our um, webinar calendars. And um, this session will be recorded, so you will be able to share, watch the video again, or your friends could do it uh, in, in another moment. And uh, it will be soon uploaded on our website and on our YouTube channel, which is Ellie Multimedia. Um, there will be a moment at the end of the session where um, Emma will be asking you for some questions. And so please feel free to write down any comments, any questions in the um, questions heading. You will find it in your menu bar on your right side. Um, that's it, I think, I know actually, another very important thing is a certificate. I know you, it's really important for you teachers. You will be receiving a certificate of attendance directly in your email box by tomorrow late uh, afternoon, evening, let's say. Check in your spam box as well, I'm afraid, because sometimes it just go there. But it will be a direct uh, email sent centrally by our platform. Uh, by the way, my name is Silvia, Silvia Petrosillo, and um, I'm, I know it's a pleasure for me to be here. And now I'm, I'm happy to, you know, to hand over to Emma Heiderman. Thank you, Emma. Thanks, Silvia. Just before you go, Silvia, I'm going to yes. share screen, and I'd just like you sure. to tell me if you can see the screen. Mm -hmm. Can you see it? Yes, perfectly. Okay. Clear. Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay. Okay, fantastic. Hi, hi everyone. Thanks ever so much for joining us on this afternoon. We were just talking, Sylvia and I, about the weather. So let me tell you a little bit about the weather. Um, out of my window, you can probably see me looking out of the window, it's kind of blue skies, but they're kind of clouds covering the sky. So anyway, I hope the weather's better where you are. So anyway, let's begin. I'm going to talk for all between 40, 45 minutes um, about the topic. Unfortunately, I can't see you and I won't, I can't see the chat box. But if you have any questions, please post them. And at the end, I hope we'll have 10 or 15 minutes for an in exchange of questions. So you'll be able to ask me questions and hopefully I'll be able to answer them. So let's get going with the presentation. So who is Emma Heidemann? Well, of course, that's me. Primarily, I'm an ELT teacher. That's, that's me. I'm a teacher. But I'm also a writer. I do write course books. Um, I'm a trainer. I enjoy training other teachers. And my final hat is I'm also a consultant. If you want to catch me outside of this presentation, one place to find me is on my blog. But that's the other place you can find me is here. And this is my city. This is San Sebastian de Nostia in the north of Spain. And as you can see, and if you look at where the sun is, this is a photo taken on my way home because this the view of our of the island is actually facing due west. So this is what it's like here. And this is what it's like here today, in fact. OK, one final comment. As Sylvia, I think she mentioned, you will be getting a copy, a PDF copy of the presentation. And at the very end, I'll be sharing a QR code so that you'll be able to um, download or take it off the um, toolbar so you'll have a copy of the PDF. So let's get started. So as I say, I'm going to talk to you about assessment. There'll be moments where I say to you, I'm just going to give you 10 seconds, 15 seconds to think about it. So I'm just going to give you some thinking time and then I'll go on. So if you do have questions during this thinking time, please put them in the chat box and I'll try and answer them at the end. So I'd like you now to imagine we're just going to start with a little writing activity. And this is something that I gave my students last year. So what we did was we had a look at this photograph, rather scary photograph of a young man or possibly woman wearing a hat. We can't see his face or her face at all. He seems to be holding a tablet, 
but it's very mysterious. I would say it's almost scary. Perhaps something's going on. What do you think? So what I then said to my students is, right, what I want you to do is this is the first part of a story. I'd like you to go home and write the first paragraph. So off my students went, they went home and they wrote their first paragraph and they came back the next day um, and I asked them to hand them in. This is one of them that came back to me and I'm just gonna give you a moment to read it. So here was a piece of writing um, and the next stage was obviously the students expected some kind of correction, assessment. So here I was, I had this paragraph and I was thinking, so what, how am I going to correct this? How am I going to assess it? Well, actually, I then took this paragraph into the staff room and somebody suggested, because these students were 12, 13 years old, that I awarded some kind of face. And they said, well, that's terrible. I would give it that. Somebody else looked at it and said, well, Emma, you want a mark out of 10 for that? I would give it that. And somebody else said, yeah, but if my students give me that sort of work, I'd ask them to rewrite it. I was a little bit surprised at these reactions um, and I said, yeah, but how's that useful for the student? This student has gone home and written this short paragraph for me and I'm saying to them, please rewrite. So somebody else said, well, we could give them a little bit of help. We could say something like that. For example, well, it's interesting, some very good language, but too many mistakes. Please rewrite. Somebody else said you could do this. So if you look here, what I've done is highlighted some of the mistakes for them. But I still wasn't convinced. I was thinking, yeah, but I mean, what I've basically done is introduced a very kind of creative topic. I've asked them to look at a photograph, go home and write about a photograph. And actually, there's a lot of real creative stuff going on in here. So if I'm just going to write, please rewrite, how demotivating is that going to be? So this is when I began to think about assessment and why do we ass assess? So that's what I want to look at now. So why are we assessing? What's the purpose? And I would say, and if you look here at my slide, there's a word missing in the middle. Have a think. Can you think about what word is missing here? And I would say <coughs> there's a possibility that we're just obsessing of learning. So basically, this is an exam. It's an assessment to see if the student has learned what we've said. But I was thinking that piece of writing isn't that. There's another type of assessment and that's for learning. Now, what does that mean? That means we need to give the student some kind of help so that they can take that nice piece of writing and make it even better. So in fact, the process of me assessing is helping them to become an even better writer. So there are two types, but I think actually there's a third. And here's the third. Now, what does as learning mean? Here, this could be the situation where actually this was a creative writing class. So I asked my students to go home and write something, bring it back to class, read it out to the other students. Everybody else is going to help um, talk about what they like about it, where it could be improved, what they would keep, what they would leave out. And the whole process of assessing becomes a learning experience because my group of learners are actually learning how to assess. So really for the purposes of today and because we've only got 40 minutes, I'm gonna very much focus on assessment for learning. What I mean again by that is 
how can we help students through assessment get to be even better writers? So how am I going to do this? Well, I'm going to, I want, I want you to do is just to think about three things. Number one is the criteria. What kind of criteria are we going to use? Are we just going to put a sad face? Are we just going to put a mark, for example, five out of 10? Or are we going to do a little bit more? And then if this is assessment for writing, how are we going to help them get better? What kind of preparation for the task are we going to give them? And the final thing is feedback. What makes useful feedback? What sort of feedback can I give my students so that they can become the best possible writers? So I'm hoping that makes sense to all of you. So as I said, we're going to start with the actual criteria. How are we going to evaluate the writing? So as I mentioned at the very beginning, I live in wonderful Donostia, San Sebastian. I live very close to the beach. And at the moment, the waves, it's February, so the waves are crashing on the shore. A lot of surf going on. Um, and you can see at the bottom, there's a wave. Now, this is actually an illustration of something that's called the backwash effect. Other people call it the washback, but I'm going to call it the backwash. And basically what this means is how an end result can have an effect on everything that goes on before. So, for example, if my students know that if they hand in a piece of writing and I don't like it and I give them a five, they're going to have to rewrite it. So it's what effect my assessment has on what they do before. So if one of my criteria is the spelling has to be 100%, the backwash effect might be that they check their spelling. If my students know that I'm going to be really angry and I'm going to say something really strong if they hand in a piece of writing that I don't like, actually the backwash effect could be that they never hand in any writing because they know every time they hand it in, I'm going to get angry and they just don't want that situation and they look for ways not to do it. So um, what I thought I'd do is take one of the most commonly used criteria, which comes from the Cambridge exams. So this is taken directly from the PET exam, the preliminary exam. This is the preliminary for schools handbook. And let's just have a look at what Cambridge suggests is a student who gets top marks. On the writing paper, if you remember, a five is the top mark. The marks are divided into four categories. So let's have a look and see what the backwash effect would be on each category. So if you have a look at the first category, this, of course, relates to content. Now, this one's an interesting one because actually, as far as Cambridge is concerned, as long as the student manages to include all the content that is expected, they can get full marks. So to my mind, there's no reason why a student couldn't get a five in this category as long as they've answered the question and as long as they've read the question carefully. So in the case of my person, my student who wrote uh, the short paragraph about the um, scientists and the hacker, as long as they answer my question, they should be getting a five. And the backwash effect, I would hope, will make sure that our students read the question carefully. Let's have a look at number two. Now, when um, Cambridge talks about conventions and communicative tasks, what they're talking about is, well, what type of writing is it? Because obviously, if it's a story, it's going to be fairly gripping stuff, lots of adjectives, probably a lot of use of the past. If it's an email, it's going to have to begin like an email. Hi, Mark, how are you? If it's a report, it's going to be have to be structured. That's what they're talking about, the convention of what the student's actually doing. Um, and he, this is called, in Cambridge terms, communicative achievement. So does it set out to do what it should do? 
So, for example, in the case of a story, what's the purpose of a story? To entertain the reader. So does the story entertain me? Does it grip me? Does it grab me? Number three, have a look at that. The text is generally well organized, coherent. We've got some linking words and also the cohesive devices. These are things like, for that reason, talking about him, so it's referring back, giving it all a kind of structure. And in Cambridge terms, this is organization. So once again, as long as my student is able to organize the story into three clear paragraphs or four or whatever, but the paragraphs have a structure and that the sentences are connected, our students should, to be, should be able to do very, very well. So what's very interesting here is the first three categories are actually talking about the skill of writing. And it's only the last category, if you have a look at the last category, that we're actually talking about the language. So when, my, um, when I took that piece into the staff room and my colleagues started saying, give it a five, get them to rewrite it, what they were talking about was the language. And in fact, in Cambridge terms, that's only a quarter of the mark. So this um, something very interesting to think about, that often as teachers, we concentrate on the language, but it's actually very, it's other things that are just as important and help our students to become better writers, not only in the classroom, but also in real life. So in the future, should they need to write an email? Maybe they need to write to a friend in another country. Maybe they need to write to the host family that they're going to stay with. What we want them to do is to become much better writers. And this section here on language, errors do not impede communication. This basically means as long as I can understand it, it's kind of OK. So that's interesting. So here are my criteria. Keep those in your head and don't forget the backwash effect. What effect is my criteria going to have on their writing and my students' writing? So I've got my criteria and I'm going to stick with the Cambridge criteria because they're criteria I knew, know well. And let's now look at a Cambridge task. So this task is taken from the B1 exam. So my students are on holiday and they're going to write an email. And in Cambridge fashion, they need to include these bullet points. So my students need to talk about the journey. They need to talk about the place, but they also need to talk about what they like best. Now, don't forget that some of my criteria actually refers to whether they answer the question. Is the content there? How do they organize it? What about the communication? So what I would do with my students is I think the first thing they're going to struggle with is the content. How can I get them thinking about these things, thinking about how they got to the place on holiday? How are they going to describe the place? How are they going to talk about what they like best? And how I do this is actually through photographs. So I begin the class saying, well, I've been on holiday recently. Would you like to see my holiday snaps? And hopefully somebody will say yes. So I show them some of the snaps from my holidays. So here you go. Something else I might get them to do is to identify the place, the places. The next thing I would do is I would put them into small groups. I would say one of you is going to describe one of the photographs, but don't tell the others which one you're describing. Others listen and tell them at the end which photograph they're describing. So let me give you a demonstration. And in fact, with my students, I would often demonstrate first. So this is what I would do. But I would try and make it very natural. I would try and say, well, look, look at this photo. This was a wonderful holiday. Look here. Um, there was lots and lots of beautiful water. And look at the bridge. Isn't it amazing? I can even see people on the bridge. 
So what we did was we started on this side of the bridge and we crossed the bridge completely to the other side. And something really incredible happened. As we were crossing the bridge, suddenly the clock started ringing. The bell started chiming. Bom, bom. It was quite incredible. And it was such a strong noise. So I think you can probably guess what um, photo I'm describing. So my students are doing this in groups. Um, the other technique I've used is I've actually handed out the photographs to them in groups. The others can't see the photograph. One of the students describes the photograph and the other three have to draw what the student was describing. But once they finished, I say, well, that's fine. I heard lots of good describing going on, but ah, do you think we could get your language a little bit better? Let's try and make this better. So what I would do next is show them this. So I would show them some words. We would look at the words. We would look at the pronunciation. In particular, what I find with my own students is they have trouble with the stress. So if you have a look at the first expression, elegant bridges, what I would do is really look at how we say that correctly. So I say elegant, and then I'd ask them to repeat the word. Everybody, elegant. And I'd also look at some of the other words. words. For example, with food, I would get them to say delicious. And I'd also emphasize the fact that because it's a positive adjective, we're going to move our voice. So we don't say delicious, we say delicious. And the same goes with the next word. I don't say disgusting, I say disgusting. So once we've gone through the words and we, we've done the pronunciation, I say to them, okay, I'm gonna help you in a minute, but with your partner, I want you to try and categorize the, food, the words. So I want you to work together, I want you to help each other and decide which box you're gonna put each word into. So, for example, if we take the first one, if you remember, is elegant, we're going to put it here. And if we look at the next word, we're going to put it with journey. So I'd then ask the students to do this together. And at the end, I would say, OK, so which words did you find difficult? Which words did you not know? And I would help them with the meaning. So we've now got the students have now got a grid with some words and I've asked them to write it down in their notebooks. Now they've got the words, I'd ask them to go back to our photographs. And what I would ask them to do is to choose one of the photographs and just think about how they could use the words to describe the photograph. And then I would mix around the pairs and one of them would describe their photograph using the words and their partner would listen and have to say which photograph they were describing. So that's an, that's an approach I often use, which we call test, teach, test, which basically means at the beginning they do it. I say to them, that's fine. Let's make it even better. I give them some more language and then we do it again just to check that they are using the new vocabulary. And now I think my students have got the language to do the piece of writing, but they're probably still missing the organization and possibly just making sure that this email is really, really communicative. So the communicative part, what I would do is this. And I often do this. I often do something that's speaking into writing. So by this, I mean, I would now do a conversation with them. I would say, what can you see at the top? It's a phone. What are they doing? They're speaking. Where do you think the student is? Yes, the student's on holiday. And I would show them the first line. And I normally take on the part of A and my students are B. So I would begin something like, hi guys, it's me. And my students would say, I can almost hear you saying it, but you're a little bit flat. I would say, hi, Emma, how are you? How was the journey? Everybody? The journey. 
It was okay. Unfortunately, the plane was delayed, so we got there a little bit late, but we got here anyway. I'm, I'm glad we're here. Back to you. And you now ask me this question. The place, oh, it's fantastic. Beautiful blue skies. I think we only had one day where it was overcast. And the hotel is amazing. It's absolutely fantastic. And the food is delicious. I wonder if you can guess what the last question is. If you remember the email. Here you go. It's back to you. I can't hear you. Say it louder. Great. What do I like best so far? Well, I've met loads of people. It's just quite amazing. So what we've done is a small dialogue. I've organized it into the bullet points. We've talked about the journey. We've talked about the middle piece, the place, the weather, the hotel. And at the end, we've talked about what you like best so far. What I'd also do is then get the students to do it with their partner. So they would go back to the list in their books of the vocabulary and they'd do the dialogue again using the photograph that they chose. So we've now got, we've got the communication going, we've got some language, but what we're probably missing now is the organization. And here, what I'm a great believer in is firstly going back to the question. So we go back to the question and we just, I just remind the students about what they're going to need to do. So my first question is, where are you? And my students say, on holiday. What are you going to write? Did you say a story? No, not a story, not a report. You're right, it's an email. And what three things are you going to talk about? Number one, well done, the journey. Number two, brilliant, the place. But don't forget with the place, you can talk about the place, the weather, the hotel. Number three, can't hear you, brilliant. You have to say what you like best. And in fact, I would stay with that order and that will keep your organization right. So you've got, we've now got, we've got some language, we've got the communication, we've got the content, but we're still missing the organization. For the organization, what I would do is show them a model. So here you go, here's a model, and I'm just going to give you a minute to read it. Okay, there might be a couple of words that I need to help the students with. For example, picturesque is a new word. Also the views, that's a new word. So I'd help them with the words they didn't know. And the next thing I would do is say to them, okay. Now, obviously you can't copy this exactly, but you can copy parts of it for your own piece of writing. Which part can you copy? And hopefully they would say, hi. Hopefully they would say, we had a journey because, hopefully they'd say, we're staying in, et cetera, et cetera. And I would ask them to underline it. And they would end up with something like this. And the next stage, I would just get them quickly to compare it again with the original question. Can you just check the question again, make sure that all the content is included in this model answer? So we do a quick checklist. Have I talked about the journey? Yes. Have I talked about the place? Yes. Have I said what I like best? Yes. And then I'd say to the students, OK, so for homework, I'd like you to write your own email using this model. If we had time in the class, I might even allow them to write the first sentence, just so I can check they're doing it right and they really understood that, yes, they're using the model, okay? Something else I developed with this class was a portfolio. So I'm, I apologize that the quality isn't great on this slide, but what I asked the students to do, and I'll just quickly show you, 
is they would have to write at the top the title, so write an email. Then this is the content and the communicative achievement. Who are you writing? Sorry, why are you writing? Who are you writing to? And what points must you include? Underneath is the organization. So what are you going to include in each paragraph? And then finally, they're going to put the language. So what useful vocabulary can they use in their piece of writing? And then on the other side of the portfolio, there's a space for them to do their own piece of writing. And as you can see, this student has done it very, very well. And I've put here very, very good. And I've given them marks out of five, as Cambridge does, and they get a total mark, which is 17. The only thing I noticed when I came back to this a year later was, in fact, the student hadn't put, what do you like best? So what I don't understand is why I gave her a five. I think I really should have given her a four because she didn't in include this information. OK, so that would take that back down to 16, possibly 15, which is a bit silly because she was a very, very good student. And obviously she had planned it well, but she didn't include it when she came to the writing. So that's what I mean about task preparation. So you might say to me, that's all very well, but where do I get all that lesson idea from? Where do I get that? Well, most good course books nowadays do that. So, for example, this is the B1 course book from Ellie. And if you have a look, unit three, there's a whole page on writing. So there's a, very, there's a question, there's a really nice grid which the students fill in, there's a model, and they've also got a little section for brainstorming adjectives, adverbs, and adverbials. If we go to unit four, the same thing. This time it's writing an email. And again, there's a model, there's a question, there's a model email, there's an exam tip. But what I really, really like about this section is this, the essay checklist. And let me show you this in big. Now, this is amazing. What this is, is the student does the piece of writing and then they have a checklist to check that they've actually done everything correctly. So they've now got something that they can compare with their own writing. So they've written it, and what we're asking them to do is to assess themselves. So we've got two things going on here, assessment for learning, so they're gonna learn how to write better, but it's also assessment as learning, because they're actually learning to be more autonomous. They're learning to look back at their work and think about how they can improve it. So this is something I used and have developed um, myself. For example, and here we go, let's talk about checklists and feedback. This is a writing, um, this is actually an exam I did with my class and it was they had to write a story in the exam. And what I gave them before the exam, I gave it to them the day before, I gave them the task, but I also gave them the checklist. So I said to them, in the test, to get a good mark, you must write in the past, and I listed the past. We had just done reported speech, so I wanted them to include reported speech, include the vocabulary, and that my last point was check your work carefully. And I thought, check your work carefully is too open. When you say to a student, check your work, you say, have you checked it? And they say, yes. I think you have to tell them what to check. So this time I told them to check their spelling. This is what I would be particularly looking at. So have a look at what my, one of my students did. Here's the exam, and I apologize again for the quality, but the most important thing is two things. Number one are the green ticks. This is me. So I read through the, her piece of writing and I put a tick every time she did something. So every time she used the past simple, I put a tick. Every time the past continuous, I put a tick, et cetera, et cetera. But the most amazing thing is the student actually did the same. So at the end of the test, she had five more minutes and she read her piece of writing again and assessed herself and put a tick as she checked, she'd included everything. And this was a very good piece of writing. 
So I thought, this is great. I'm going to develop this kind of checklist because obviously it's doing two things. It's helping them improve, but it's also helping them learn to be better learners. So we're going to go down a level, and this is actually A2 key, and this is a kind of typical A2 key type task. So I'm just going to give you a minute to read the question. OK, if you notice the content, there are four questions. They have to write an email and it's to a friend. So here's one of the answers, which I'll let you read. I'm just going to remind you that this is A2 level. And I actually, I had, I'm going to show you the checklist in a minute, but I felt that Annie had answered my checklist. So in fact, I gave her 10 out of 10. So if you want to see my checklist, what I said to them for this, for this piece of writing was this, that for organization, I would give them four marks. If they answered the, sorry, I would, uh, if they answered the questions, I would give them four marks. If they used adjectives and comparatives, I would give them three marks. And if all their spelling was correct, I would give them two marks. And this all added up to 10. And that's why Anne got a 10, because she'd used the um, checklist. It had answered everything I was expecting. And it was a great answer. So you're probably thinking, how did an A2 student come up with that? Well, we did do a lot of preparation and my preparation was very similar to the holiday snap. We began with a conversation where I asked them about their, I gave them a model conversation, which I'm just going to reveal to you now. You're probably wondering about some of the vocabulary, for example, uh, I apologize, I went too far ahead. There's words like tight, ankle length. These were actually in the course book. So that's where that vocabulary is coming from. Trendy was also in the course book. So we just looked at a conversation. We looked at a model answer. They practiced it in pairs. And then I told them to change the item of clothing. So instead of saying, it's my jeans, they had to say another item of clothing. And they just had to change the key words. Once we'd done that, we looked at the question and we looked at a model answer. So I actually gave them the model answer. So they had this model answer. And again, like I did with the holiday snaps, they had to underline the key words, which they did. Once they'd done that, they went to, I gave them the checklist and I told them what I was expecting. So I was expecting organization, I was expecting answer my questions. I was expecting the adjectives and comparatives and also spelling because spelling with this group was a particular problem. And I just wanted them to realize that they could easily get two marks if they checked their spelling. And that's where Anne's piece of writing came from. OK, so this is the checklist. But now let's finish off here with the feedback. So let's go back to this first piece of writing. If you remember, I said to the, oh, the only preparation my students had was I showed them the photo and I said, now I want you to go home and I want you to write the first paragraph. So actually to expect them to come back with a creative piece of writing full of vocabulary, full of whatever, was a pretty tall order. And my poor students, I'm not surprised that they came back with things like this. And in fact, I thought this student had done very, very well. Now, let's go to the Cambridge assessment and let's see what we would say. And let's have a look at some more useful feedback. So we've got the four categories. We've got content. We've got the communicative achievement. We've got organization and language. And I'm just going to give you just a little bit of thinking time. 
what would you say to the student about content? Remember I said to the student, go home and write the first paragraph. Has the student done that? And this is what I thought. I thought it was a very good introduction. It introduced the topic, the scientists, the computers, they wanted to destroy something. The only thing I felt was it was just missing in the first paragraph, a kind of punch, something that really made me want to carry on reading. Something like, so what was going to happen next? Something like that. Maybe I was being a bit strict with this student, but that's what I felt. The next section is communicative achievement. So is this good language for a story? Are they getting my attention? What do you think? And this is what I wrote. I said, well, your story grabs my attention. I want to read more. The next one was organization. So have a look at the paragraph. Is it well organized? Does it kind of start at the beginning and finish at the end? And also look at the sentences. Are they connected? Can you see these kind of linking words or are they kind of separate sentences? Um, what I felt was this. It's a good start. It's a good introduction. But I felt that the sentences were a little bit unconnected. It was a, they read a bit kind of sentence, sentence, sentence. And maybe they could have done a bit more to put in words like, however, but, although, whatever, suddenly, these kind of words. The final category is language. Now, remember what Cambridge says, as long as the errors do not impede communication, the student actually can pass. So just remember that before you're too hard on the student. This is what I said to the student some very good vocabulary and a good use of the past but i did put watch some of your and i call them little mistakes by little i mean things like i don't think the student uh, meant to say on i think the student meant to say it was year 10000 or during year 10000 but not on um, and the spelling of whole, for example, should have been with a W. So I've now given the students some feedback and hopefully this is going to help them go away, write it again and come back with something much, much better. So what about the marks? If you remember, my colleagues wanted to give this student a five out of 10. So out of 20, that would be 10 out of 20. This is what I thought. Having looked at the Cambridge marks, this is what I got to. So with the content, I thought probably a five. With the, sorry, a four. With the achievement, I thought probably a five because it grabs my attention. With the organization, probably a four because it lacked a bit of connection. And interestingly, with the language, I thought it would just pass because there are, there are some mistakes, but it doesn't impede the communication. So now the student has 16 out of 20 and not eight, uh, which is an eight out of 10, which is a lot higher than the original five. And what I think is giving this kind of feedback to that student will be much more motivating. My student, I can help them write a better introduction and then they're more encouraged to go away and write the rest. So I'm now reaching the end. I think we've looked at the criteria and talked about how this can have a backwash effect on what the students actually write. We've looked at how to prepare them for success. So this kind of idea that if we give them some language, if we help them, they can write even better. But I think the most important thing is the kind of assessment for writing by giving them checklists, by giving them useful feedback, and also the assessment uh, as learning, meaning that the checklist will help them become better assessors of their own writing. So we're near the end of the time. As I promised, um, if you want to use the QR code, you can scan, you can get a copy of the session. 
There's also the contact information for Ellie. Okay, and really it's just thank you to you and please now ask me some questions. I'm going to stop showing the screen and I'm going to find Sylvia again and maybe Sylvia has some questions. Yes, hi Emma. Thank hi Sylvia. Hi again, yes, and thank you for your session, very, very interesting. And uh, yes, I can see, okay, already quite a few questions at the moment. Okay, let's wait for a few seconds because they are typing in. Okay, first one. Do you think that making a portfolio with, with students' writings could be good for their progress? Absolutely, absolutely. I think that's a no-brainer. With my own students, we actually put it into a book so what was happening is uh, they could then write on the back of the portfolio a list of they could then make their own checklist so at the when i handed out the writing i would say okay let's have a look let's look at your strengths and let's look at the areas where you can improve now let's take these improvements let's write them on the back of the portfolio so the next time you come to do a piece of writing look again at your first piece and it's also very motivating because the first time they ever did writing for me, everybody was getting things like 10 out of 20, 11 out of 20. And after about three or four weeks, suddenly they were all getting 15, 16. Mm -hmm. And then towards the end of the year, when I gave them much less help, they were still getting 15 because they were learning from their own mistakes. So absolutely, I think it's a brilliant idea. Okay, thank you. Then, uh, actually, there's a teacher, Sylvia, asking for, um, uh, I think she, she likes you to share the screen, the, sorry, the QR code again, but no worries about that because um, we have actually uploaded the, the, this presentation in a PDF format here, so all, all, all the participants at the moment can download it before the end of the session. It's basically under document, documents heading. OK, if you press the arrow on your menu on your right side, documents, then you can download it. OK, great. So let's go on with the other questions. So my students always make a lot of mistakes. Do you correct everything? Oh, that's a, that's another really, really good question. Um, it's a funny one and I think you have to be very honest with your students and I think you have to tell them what you're going to do. For example, if you decide, no, I'm not going to correct all the mistakes, then the students are going to have a surprise when you give it back to them and they say, but this is a mistake and you haven't corrected it. So I tell the students what I'm going to do and in fact what I do is I have two coloured pens. I have a green pen and I have a red pen. And I say the red pen is for little mistakes. And with little mistakes, I just circle them. So I just circle it and I want the student to correct it themselves. The green thing is really good. It's a new word. Let me correct it for you. OK, so I don't I highlight the mistakes. Yes. But if it's a little mistake, green pen, they have to correct it. If it's a difficult word or something that they've really tried, but it's not quite right, green pen, and I write it in myself. Hmm, that's interesting. I think the, the color coding always works, I think. Mm, mm, mm. Then, <laughs> OK, well, we have a request more than a question for you uh -huh. to, <laughs> to put together another webinar about listening skill this time. We will oh. think about it, <laughs> maybe for another moment, okay. Yeah. <laughs> then, okay, it is useful for the preparation task, developing reading skills as well. Yes, absolutely. I mean, that, that's a question. How can I become a better writer? Mm. Um, and that is a really good thing. I think you become a better writer if you do everything else. So absolutely, reading is, and, it, and it's a problem. 
uh, because our students tend not to read very long texts. They read short texts, they read mobile phones, or they read very short chats, but they're not very used to reading very long texts. So I try and encourage them to read things perhaps that they're interested in on the internet. And we maybe we do that together. Maybe on the board we find something, maybe something about that's happening in the Olympics at the moment. I might find a short, short paragraph and get them to read that together. The other thing that I think makes people a better writer is also to listen. I think listening to good language and maybe getting them to things like listening to very good lyrics and reading the lyrics. So obviously there are some singers who are also very, very good writers. So get them to listen to the song and read the lyrics. And finally, somebody mentioned listening, but I think listening, I think it's also integrated. You know, you it's whatever you can receive, the output is gonna be so much better. So yes, absolutely. The more right, reading they can do, the better they'll become at writing. Thank you. Then I've got quite a few similar questions about the fact that um, um, you know teachers sometimes feel a little bit uncomfortable because students feel uncomfortable because they 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 perceive they they are judged they've been judged by the teachers. Mm -hmm. So for example, this one: How could we motivate our students to accept the feedback and not feeling uncomfortable on it? Very very good point. And what I think you need to do is think back to the days when you were either learning English or learning another language and kind of think, so what did I want to hear? So if somebody says to me, that's wrong, that's really bad, please rewrite, that's not going to motivate me. It's kind of thinking about, I think the most difficult thing about writing is getting started. So thinking about things like getting them to do the first bit in class. So we talked about the postcard. Why don't you get them to write the first postcard in groups together? They've got the model, get them to write it together. Now take that model home and write another one, write a third one. And that's an easy, easy piece of homework because all they've got to do is copy the model and change eight words, little by little, removing that kind of support. We call it scaffolding, you know, remove that support until they're doing it themselves. The other thing that my students love, uh, loved when we were writing a story is collaborative, writing it together. But how we did it was everybody wrote the first line at the top of a piece of paper. They passed it to the next person who wrote the next line. Then they passed it to the next person who wrote the next line. And they kept passing it round and round the classroom. When we finished, they had the piece of paper, they read through the story, and then they had to go home and write it out again, but correcting any of the mistakes. So they had to check the spelling, et cetera, et cetera. But it's this kind of idea that they're going to write it together, help each other, you're there, you're supporting them. And the homework bit is the easy bit. All I've got to go home to do is just check it's OK. So if you think about it, as a writer, when you're writing an email, it's the first draft that's the most difficult. But when you go back and read it again and correct it, that's much, much easier. So maybe the first draft really helped them, maybe let them do that with you in class. And then the kind of second draft they do at home. Thank you. This actually goes with another question, our last uh -huh. one, I would say. Um, so my students always complain when I ask them to write. How can I get them to write them? So it actually the moment. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and definitely, you know, I what I do at the beginning of every class is I always write on the board what we're going to do that day. And whenever they see writing, they all go oh, <laughs> and start groaning. And I think it's what I just said. What you need to do is set it up in a way that all they've got to do is go home and do the easy bit. So it could be, especially at these kind of lower level, probably not exam students who just mm. need a little bit more encouragement or get them just to write the first paragraph. You know, just go home and write the first 50 words, bring it back to class. Let's have a look at it together. Great. Let's mark it together, give each other feedback. Now go home and finish it. So it's just that kind of getting them going, if that makes sense. Yes, it does, it does. Okay, so I think we have reached the end, we come to the end of the session. So, um, well, first of all, I'd like, you know, thank you, Emma, for being here, being with us, and, you know, for this
very clear and practical session. So we'll see for the future, maybe this one about listening then, <laughs> as we were <laughs> at it, for the listening skill. And then thanks to all the teachers who you know join us. Uh, I can see all of them coming from many, so many parts from, from the world globe, from the world. So before I, you know, I close this session, just remember to download the uh, PDF for the presentation. And remember, you will be receiving the certificate uh, tomorrow about this time or less. And uh, further information on uh, www.aleonline.com. So thank you. Thank you again, then. Arrivederci. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you, Emma. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.